Hello and welcome back to another episode of Oncology Brothers Podcast. I'm Rohit Gosain and alongside with my brother and co-host Rahul Gosain. We are both practicing community medical oncologists and our mission is to keep you, our community colleagues, informed and up to date with latest in cancer, especially how fast this field continues to change. Today, we are excited to continue our discussion on HER2 positive breast uh, biliary tract cancer. For this second episode, we are thrilled to have Dr. Shobham Buns from MD Anderson join us again. Shobham, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a, it's an honor and a pleasure. Shobham, welcome. Rohit, I know you were slipping up with breast cancer because historically when it comes to HER2, that is what we've seen, but it's amazing how fast this field's changed. In our first episode, we set the stage by discussing the overall treatment landscape for biliary tract cancer, the role of chemoimmunotherapy, and then the importance of NGS and biomarker testing. Today, Shubham, we want to focus specifically on HER2-positive disease, and I hope we get to touch on who needs testing, once we have testing, what to make out of it, from IHC3 plus to FISH positive versus ERBB2 mutation on NGS, and then of course, the treatment options in this space. Shubham, before we talk about treatment options, can you start us off with the basics? When it comes to biliary tract cancers, be it intrahepatic, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, and gallbladder cancers, who are you testing HER2 for? And what classifies as HER2 positive disease for you saying, all right, this is when I'm going to use my treatment options here? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Rahul. And Rohit, that happens all the time also, because again, we're all kind of used to all the HER2s from decades back, right? When we were in residency hearing about, you know, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and the whole, uh, you know, all, all these drugs which came out. So coming to biliary tract cancer, again, that this concept is developing a little bit. So GI cancer is now the HER2 positivity. We are testing it in different cancers. Obviously, biliary tract cancer, gastric cancer, colorectal cancer. But coming to biliary tract cancer, easy answer, Rahul, everybody should be tested. So when patients come to my clinic, I do test everybody for HER2 amplification. And I'll tell you why. Because let's say, you know, there was, uh, we have the FGFR2 inhibitors uh, in, uh, in biliary tract cancer. Folks don't know the FGFR fusion is about 5% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, so not very high. Coming to HER2 and biliary tract cancers, if you have intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, it can be 5%. If you have extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, it can be 10 to 15% amplification. And if you have gallbladder cancer, it can be up to 30% amplification. That is high. So when you average it out, it's exactly the way I remember it. And I would uh, you know, have your colleagues remember it is just think about like breast cancer, actually, Rohit. Think about 20%. So that's kind of, you know, on, on an average that we find HER2 amplification in biliary tract cancers. Now, how do we determine who's HER2 amplified is, is the question of the hour. So there are two ways that I normally use this is one, you know, when patients come to me, I do try to send that next generation sequencing uh, for them. And if you have an increased HER2 copy number, that means you have HER2 amplification by that testing, whatever, you know, next generation sequencing testing uh, you do, you know, I consider them as HER2 positive. The second one is the patients who are, you know, when you do the immunohistochemistry, if you do our old test, right, you just paint, pathologists just paint on the surface of the tumor cells, you have the immunohistochemistry. If you're three plus, you're positive. Uh, it's a true oncogenic driver. If you're two plus, then, you know, if you do the FISH test, which is positive, I consider them positive. But there are nuances to it. And I can talk to you about the treatment, about how it differs. But overall, that's how I consider that patients are hurt to amplify. But I do test them at the beginning. Because honestly, if you don't test, you will not find. That's the main thing. So you got to test, you know. And, and honestly, like in biliary tract cancer, it is such a target-rich disease now. Uh, you know, that you really should be testing for approved agents and for a lot of clinical trials that our patients could be eligible for. Thanks for laying that foundation, Shubham. And as you stated, it is getting personalized medicine, just like lung cancer and exactly is being replicated here in biliary tract cancer, given the targeted therapies that we have. 
We just recently covered lung cancer and HER2 positive space. There, we rely on NGS testing. And here, as you were mentioning, uh, Shabam, that you do IHC and then fish amplification and uh, NGS. Now, do you do this concurrently that will, you will do IHC testing followed by fish testing in-house and then also send NGS, especially when we have limited tissue? Are you prioritizing one over the other at all? Yeah, I try to do both, honestly, but I do try to get NGS, right? NGS in a way, because what happens is we, you know, that in that you can find other targets also, right? So we get, you know, other, tar you know, other targets also, but uh, I try to do both just to try to know how much it is driven by her. So I try to do both in a way, but the discordance rate is actually fairly low. Um, if you have heard of three plus disease, if you're amplified, you know, again, that data is coming out in biliary tract cancer, but if you're amplified, you have a pretty good chance of being heard to three plus or, uh, you know, the discordance in these trials came was when patients were heard to two plus and wish positive. Sometimes they were not amplified on NGS. So, you know, that can be there, but I think if they're amplified, I'm pretty confident that, you know, those patients are going to get benefit from the, from the therapy. The approval is not for that, but <laughs> I'm pretty uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, confident that, you know, that is, that is, that is the case. And we're generating more data uh, as we go along. The, the thing is that uh, we really don't see so many cholangiocarcinomas in the U.S. It's a relatively rare disease. So what we're doing is at MD Anderson, we are partnering with, let's say, you know, uh, our Korean uh, investigators, Asian investigators to bring out, uh, you know, data in which we can kind of look at our side and then they can look at their side and we can kind of, you know, compare and contrast those data. Again, in this global effort, we're hoping that these patients are living longer because of these uh, interventions. So Shubham, now let's say that patient in front of you is indeed HER2 positive. In first line, our option is still chemoimmunotherapy, correct? Yes. Just being HER2 positive disease is not changing your first line treatment in any way. It is in a way that because we have these uh, uh, two trials now with trastuzumab deracitacan, a phase three trial, uh, which is, uh, you know, gem, gem cytopine cisplatin dervalumab uh, compared to trastuzumab deruxetacan compared to TDXD with a, with a biospecific immunotherapy. So that's one trial. And then the other trial we have is called Horizon VTCO2, which is a global trial which combines zanidatamab, which we'll talk about a little bit, a new novel biospecific HER2 agent, uh, which is gem cytopine cisplatin dervalumab with or without zanidatamab. So, and those trials are available to most centers in the U.S. and they'll probably be within like a 50 mile radius, not, you know, not more than I think than a hundred mile radius towards from any, anybody's practice. Uh, so those trials are available also in the Horizon BTCO2 patients can be accrued even if they've received two cycles of chemotherapy. So just to make it more practical, right? The patient shows up in your clinic and they're like, you know, Dr. Gassan, I want to start, uh, I want to start therapy yesterday, right? Those are our patients, right? We understand that. So you can start the therapy and still send their NGS. And if you have an effort to positivity, then you can still enroll on the trial. So we try to make it as patient friendly as possible, as physician friendly as possible. So there are options. But to come to your original point, Rahul, off clinical trial, yes. Uh, these agents are after first line setting. So gemcitabine cisplatin with a checkpoint inhibitor, whichever one you choose. Well, actually, this is a good segue to talk about these agents. So the same patient gets chemoimmunotherapy outside clinical trial, now has progressive disease. In second line, you mentioned we have trastuzumab deruxtecan based off pan tumor study, recent approval of zanidatumab. Then we also have off-label trastuzumab, pertuzumab. Shubham, can you touch on some of the data here and how are you thinking of that second line treatment decision? Yes, great question. So uh, when I look at that, so the way you have to look at it, you have to look at four kind of, uh, you know, not agents, but kind of, you know, kind of four chemotherapy or uh, target therapies uh, that we have seen in different trials. The first one uh, was pertuzumab with trastuzumab, which was done by a trial called My Pathway Basket Trial, and about 30 to 40 patients were with uh, cholangiocarcinoma, HER2 amplified were part of that trial. And the response rate in that was about 29% with that. And then the second was to catenib with trastuzumab. And that was presented at ASCO, again, part of a basket trial, again, 30 to 40 patients, uh, which was uh, the response rate in that was in the 40s, right? So it was about, I think it was over 42%. And then you have, or 46%. And then you have uh, the third and the fourth, which are actually approved. So these two are in the NCCN guidelines, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, trastuzumab to catenib, NCCN guidelines part of basket trials. Third basket trial was the destiny trials that you were talking about, which was a basket trial for trastuzumab deruxetacan. 
the patients who had HER2 three plus disease. Again, it was about, you know, the, the cohort was like 30 to 40 patients. Again, co uh, uh, patients who are HER2 three plus disease had a 56% response rate. Again, these are refractory patients. That's, that's, that's amazing. Considering if you treat with Volfox, that's a 5% response rate in the phase three trial. So 56% response rate. And then the newest kid on the block, Zani Datamab, which is a very interesting agent. It's a bispecific HER2 agent, um, which binds to something called ECD2 and 4, so extracellular domain 2 and 4 of, uh, of the HER pathway. And it leads to better binding by doing that and it, in better receptor internalization, better target engagement with that. And that trial was a unique trial because it's, it's the only biliary tract cancer focused trial. So it was a, a global trial. Um, it was in 32 sites across four continents. 80 patients were enrolled who are HER2 amplified. That means they were either HER2 3 plus or 2 plus and ish positive, which was inside to hybridization positive. And then that, the response rate for the whole cohort was about 42%. But when you looked at the HER2 3 plus, it was 52%. The interesting thing about that study, which I, uh, which I found was, and uh, you know, I was involved in the study full disclosure, is uh, that patients had this duration of response. That means once you started getting a response, those patients, the duration of response was 14.9 months. And for refractory disease, that's like the median overall survival for patients with HER2 3 plus disease on that study was 18.1 months. It is like, you know, and honestly, the way I look at HER2 disease and biliary tract cancer, I look at it like breast cancer. It, it seems to be a little bit more aggressive disease because gallbladder cancer is actually a lot, a little, lot more aggressive than intrahepatic cholangio and extrahepatic cholangio. They're very different diseases. So gallbladder cancer, you want to hit them hard, hit them fast, because it's a very, those cells rapidly divide. Intrahepatic cholangio carcinoma is a little different. So I think some of it is also HER2, uh, HER2 driven, that if you have HER2 positivity, you can have a worse prognosis, just like we had in breast cancer, but we don't have that big data of breast cancer. Well, wow. Thanks so much for covering that. And as we know that there are multiple options, as you stated, Shivam. So patient shared decision making is the key when we have to keep side effects in mind and patient comorbidities in mind. Something to address with regards to zenidetumab, even though this is a bispecific, it is certainly no engaging our T cells or B cells. As a result, it does not cause cytokine release syndrome that we've seen with some of the bispecific hematological agents or even with tarlatumab in small cell lung cancer though we could see infusion reactions, but often not severe. Yeah, you're 100% you're right, Rohit. And sorry to interrupt you. So which people don't understand, it's called a bispecific. It's actually something called a biparatropic. I won't go into that, but it's actually, should be called a biparatropic, but I think it's too like wonky for people to understand that. So, but it's, it is, you're right. It's not tied to like a CD3 agent that's going to cause CRS. Main side effects that we saw was Zanidatamab were actually diarrhea. So actually I started a patient uh, yesterday on Zanidatamab. So we just educated them, gave them Imodium to take home. Hey, if you get diarrhea, you get fluids. Let us know how things uh, let us know how things go. So that's the main thing. Infusion reactions very rare, but you have to pre-medicate the patients with Benadryl and steroids, and I also give them Pepsid. And then that infusion reaction, I think, the rate three was like one percent. It was it was it was it was fairly fairly low. Uh, so yeah, they differ according to their side effect profile. Uh, so it's a, that's a really important point. Thank you for bringing it up. There's certainly favorable side effect profile, but with regards to TDXD, at least as a community oncologist, because of these bucket approvals, we have a bit more experience, though one still has to keep in mind nausea, vomiting, fatigue, cytopenias. At the end of the day, it still has some chemotherapeutic side effects. Something very important is the ILD, um, which is associated with mortality. We will dive into more into the side effect profile with Dr. Rushna Shroff into our next episode. What's more important here, uh, Shubham, is sequencing. How are you planning with regards to that using zanidatumab first and then keeping TDXD or TDXD first and then zanidatumab? And another one, are you doing HER2 testing when the patient progresses? Great question. Uh, keep the best for the last. So, uh, <laughs> so the way uh, we don't know that, honestly, that's the honest answer. After frontline therapy, you can use either. I think both are great agents, zanidatumab, or trastuzumab deroxitecan. I'll tell you how I made that choice in this patient of mine. Uh, they, he got gemsis derva. And then, you know, because the trouble was he didn't have tissue and, you know, we kept on sending tissue. We didn't. So I re-biopsied him. Uh, I started him on full fox, re-biopsied him. And then I got my HER2 amplification. Okay. And like literally two months, he's gallbladder cancer, two months. And then he progressed on full fox. 
but the issue is he's having like these side effects of chemo. He's having fatigue, tiredness and things. So for him, I chose Zani data map because, you know, that, you know, I've had a lot of ex decent experience with it. And it's just kind of, a, you know, patients don't get like the chemotherapy side effect because it's just kind of, you know, it's just binds to these two ECD two and four. So it's fairly well tolerated. Uh, because I just, you know, trust is no direct. Can I haven't given it because I do mostly, I have given it to a number of people, but in the biliary tract concept, because I don't treat other, you know, other than GI cancers. I just feel like the patients do get the side effects. Like I've had, you know, nausea and, you know, so they feel like they're on, you know, they're on chemo essentially. So just keeping the ILD aside, they still feel it. So fatigue, nausea, things like that. So I, I chose that for him, but if a patient like breathes through chemotherapy is doing great. Well, I could I could choose transfer duraxetecan for them. I think it's a it's a appropriate choice. Now, if they progress, this patient progress on Zani data map, then I'm definitely going to biopsy, rebiopsy, or send a CT DNA to see if the amplification is still there. To, before I treat with the next agent, which probably is going to be transfer duraxetecan, if the patient is, you know, uh, but there is no data for that in biliary tract cancer. But I'm extrapolating that from gastric cancer, where you know once they've had trastuzumab before you give them a hurt to target agent second line, you want to retest them essentially. So I'm going to do that. Uh, not a lot of data for that, not enough patients, but that's how I choose. I really look at the patient and if they're getting those chemotoxicities, then I try to give them a kind of a little bit of a break uh, because uh, honestly, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, any data map is just, you know, doesn't, does not have those uh, side effects, but you know, either one is fine. I think so. If I'm coming back to your clinical trials that you brought up, once these agents are available in first line, the sequence is going to be more and more important because we want to make sure these patients are exposed to these active agents. Before we close, you had also said that HER2 ends up being more aggressive disease. When we're talking about HER2 positive cancer, we often worry about intracranial disease. We've seen this in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer. What about biliary tract cancer? Any role of surveillance brain MRI in these patients? Is the incidence high even in biliary tract cancer? Uh, the 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 tra tragedy has been that patients don't live long enough. You know, so you need to live long enough for let's say biliary or pancreatic cancer to really great uh, get the brain metastases, which is true for breast cancer and for lung cancer and for other cancers. So we want to change biliary tract cancer into a more like in a way chronic disease as we call it with breast cancer and such. Uh, we there there have been anecdotal reports of patients showing up with brain metastases, but honestly, it's not very common, but I hope to, I mean, I don't hope to see brain metastases more, but what I'm saying is our patients live long enough uh, and we, we can know if that develops or not. There have been anecdotal reports of uh, brain metastases showing up, but uh, honestly, in my practice, and I see quite a few biliary tract cancers, I can't remember the, you know, last patient who got a brain metastases. Uh, it's just, it's just rare. Still, it's rare just because of median survival, again, 12 months. Uh, but I know we are pushing the envelope. So, uh, you know, here's hoping, you know, for, for that patients do stay on these drugs for longer and have longer progression-free survival and we're on longer overall survival. You know, we've covered a lot here. Though biliary tract cancer is where we're looking for these actionable mutations and biomarkers that's driving our treatment decision is very important. Shubham, thanks for covering the data for Destiny Pan Tumor for TDXD, Horizon BTC01 for Zanidatumab, and our other available options for HER2 positive biliary tract cancer. To our listeners, thank you for joining us. Make sure to check out our next episode where we touch on side effects and management of these available options in HER2 positive space. We are the Oncology Brothers.